So, uh, this is uh, the Enterprise One Writer's Room. Is that a good name for it? Yeah, the Writer's Room. Yeah. Uh, I'm Van Velding. I make the Beige and the Bold. That's like it. I am Doc like, yes. Dr. Isaacs, and uh, I don't make Beige and the Bold. <laughs> Usually. All right, so... <laughs> Episode three, I, I pitched you some stuff and you said, hey, I was thinking of that. Something like that. What were you thinking of? Uh, something uh, where there was on a space station. Uh, you had a little bit more specific of what's, what was going on there. And they're basically trying, there's something involving uh, something unfulfilling about the Federation life that was, you know, bothering people in some fashion. Uh, alternatively, uh, someone who did, did did some crimes and then got caught and, you know, the, their explanation is basically the same thing. The my deal is like, hey, in the actual navy, you have a home port. That's where your family is. That's where you go in periodically. The original Enterprise was supposed to be on a five-year mission, but they did an awful lot of domestic work for being on a five-year deployment uh, with no home port stuff. So, you know, yes. they're they're poured out of Starbase seventy forty-seven because forty-seven is the Star Trek number, and. So they come in, and we get like a bunch of yes. personal things, and then the guy that runs the service is like, hey, Kirk, I need your help with something. You know, your crew has families that live here. People are stealing. We think it's the non-Federation citizens. Um, you know, I need your help to figure this out. And so Quark is there, right? Uh, and it's Kirk versus Quark, which mm -hmm. is interesting. And it turns out that it is Federation people who are stealing because they're they're unfulfilled for for some reason. You know, we have like an introspective look of hey, how is the Federation sometimes unfulfilling? How is maybe life on a starbase or life as um, the significant other or the family of the Starfleet member unsatisfying? And then we have maybe family who are like, hey, look, what we're doing is important, but I can't tell you because you're like a Starfleet guy. It's like if I let you know what's up. I could get in trouble because you'd have to report it, yeah. and that's not yeah. cool. So I, I was thinking, uh, as far as you know, some of the, the basics about the station here, Station Forty Seven, our, our Starbase Forty Seven. Uh, would this be a good um, place to yes, have Seven show it's up? A good place for her to be there. I mean, all of the, all of the characters that we can't put into Starfleet uniforms and have them on the ship. Which honestly, I think we we put, we put Kess in Starfleet uniform, didn't we? Um, so just the ones ones we didn't just because oh, of yes. you know one reason or another. Um, they could be based out of here. They could work from here. You know, my image was seven as kind of a consultant, maybe even someone, you know, like whatever, TV, TV. But she, yeah, yeah, she could be here. Yeah, in that case, uh, you yeah, know, she might be a, a good starting pl uh, point as far as kicking off the uh, <laughs> we got a problem sort of thing. Uh, and, yeah, and even if she's not in the plot for very long, just sort of a, you know, it's like, hey, hey Captain, um, I, I, I've, been, I've gotten these, these weird reports here and uh, as part of my job doing whatever here, and uh, I was wondering if you could look into those uh, while you're here, because, well, obviously I'm not having any luck with this, and getting some help would be kind of nice. Yeah, I mean, what's an A plot without um, a compelling B plot that intersects with it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, our our core issue is, what is it that's driving Federation citizens? Maybe not the theft. It could be some other uh, socially deviant behavior that's hard to trace to one person. Um, Assault, uh, sabotage, mm -hmm. uh, dick pics, drug. I mean, could be drug use. D drug use. Uh, <laughs> dick pics would actually be kind of amusing. I, you know, like if you do drug use, then you're using drugs. Like Quark's holding holding down Jake Cisco and saying, "Do drugs." You know, like it has to be kind of a nod. You have to be able to do it anonymously. Well, you know, it could be a, you know not the standard TV sort of drug use sort of stuff. Like, you know, because the Federation's a lot about, you know, it's like, yes, we're going to make right. ourselves better. And that's sort of our driving force. And that's, you know, sort of our whole thing. And, you know, what about the folks that just can't? They, 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 they're like, you know, chronically depressed or something like that. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the situation, you know, you know, tries to discourage them from, uh, you, know, you know, from sort of trying to take care of that so much. 
and said sort of push on to this uh, you know this philosophy of uh, self improvement and that if you're not self improving enough then that means you're inherently <laughs> bad in our society here and so then they could sort of like, eh, I'll get on some antidepressants here. Well, oh, we, they won't let me have as much as I need. I will get on something that will um, be just as good. In, in our thing. age sheet, I have one called Pulp, right, which is about common people and remembering, like, the value and the importance of common people and then the perspective they bring to the table. So mm -hmm. I think one problem, I think the Federation should have, you know, centuries, literal centuries of uh, evidence-based psychology and things like that where i mean mental illness conventionally maybe uh some that people manage but maybe like in a federation thing like ambition people are, are ambitious to push themselves to be better like you were saying but oftentimes our reach exceeds our grasp and one of the the more tenacious feats of humanity uh is knowing when to quit knowing when something is beyond your reach yes. but also knowing something is not beyond your reach and want to strive for it would that would that intersect the axis that you're trying to go on i think it would actually yeah uh yeah it's a sort of and, and so you know the you know the, you know, the deviant behavior you know whatever we end up uh, going with you know is sort of becomes a as you know a, a symptom of folks either not taking that sort of uh, posi position or trying to be discouraged from uh, right. knowing when to um, quit and ultimately, like the problem has to be, and I don't like it, but I think it's I think it's a good story, and I think you should do it. You should say, "Hey, look, this is top down. This is a Starfleet to Federation culture issue, where the the disconnect is top down instead of bottom up, making sure that the the system is kind of dysfunctional and not the people. The people are functional. You know, people are trying, you know, just trying to live their best life, and well. They're not able to quite do that, then well, sure, it's that. not really their fault. Okay, uh, what about what about a scene? Is there like a good scene? I mean, the thought of Quark versus Kirk is interesting. Got to get them in a room uh, at least for a little bit for for a time. You know, it could be a sort of a you know, I, you know, he, he, he's going out there. Maybe there's a couple other characters that sort of help him out. Uh, could even have Odo in there, you know, doing stuff as well. Uh, but you know, get Kirk. Kirk is like, no, I, I want to talk to him one on one, and it's like, it's like, are you, you going to be like trying to punch him to get answers? No, I'm gonna, just going just gonna to talk to him. Uh, and yeah, they have sort of a, a one on one exchange that is very much, you know, the principles of the Federation laid out, you know, by uh, by Kirk and Quark, kind of coming back and sort of pointing out, you know, out the hole, uh, some of the holes there in you know, order to sort of lead him on to what the actual uh, problem is going on uh, without sort of revealing his own involvement, if any, in uh, which that, is, that whole which is what enterprise there. Best. Um, Quirk, you know. <laughs> yes. It's like, you know, you know, this is sort of a, there's just, there's people might be thinking about this, you know, and yeah, you know, if there's this whole thing not going on quite right in the Federation, then there's going to be somebody out there that's going to be providing yeah, the service, I, you know? Quirk lampoons and challenges a lot, a lot of Federation ideology. And I don't, I don't like believe the whole Frankie never had slavery. They just have indentured servitude, which is like slavery with more accounting. But like, you know, like it's. Yes. <laughs> and yeah, that, that's not even like you yeah. know, getting to the, and, and you know, how they treat ladies. Know, but when Quirk is used well, it's a great thing. Um, and I like, I like your kind of, prescriptivist prescriptive your, your idea of what of how he can engage with kirk um because kirk does deal with like the these sleazy trader guys a lot like it, it shows up a lot in star trek um Sir cyrano jones obviously harry mm -hmm. mod um tng did something like that with okona or they tried whatever Okona was. The outrageously dull Hulk or Okana. We could have him show up in the background and just kind um, of get ignored. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's interesting. But um, yeah, so, so you know, Quark can supply it or he can facilitate it. Um, it would be interesting to have Quark smuggling, you know, therapy books. What was that, what was that movie with Anton Yelchin um, where he's giving people therapy? And, and prescriptions in high remember. school. He's faking that he has these mental illnesses, but he's prescribing things to his classmates to help them out, like Marty Summer or something like that. <laughs> um, it, it sounds like that. It's, Marty Summer. It's, it's, it's not. Oh, Marty I'll have to look that up. Like it's, it's Charlie 
anyway, Charlie X. No, that's that's another true. episode. Um, so yeah, yeah. Uh, and so I think a good scene where Kirk's like, "Look, Mister Quark, I'm tired of hearing your, you know, your business. I want to know what's really going on here." And Quark is like, "I'm just a trader. I'm just trading things, but kind of giving up the game." Well, if uh, so, so I, I guess we need to pin down a little bit more exactly what uh, people are getting into. That's you know causing a problem that is noticeable enough that you know someone non Starfleet is like, "Hey, we need some help here." Um, so do do we want it to be something dangerous, something as just unsettling or unusual, or do we want something to be kind of My just really out initially there? Initially, it seems harmful, but then you learn more, and it turns out it's harmless. But I feel like I push that for every episode. I feel like I've always been like. You know, you, you enter this preconception and it's not that preconception. Um, you know, I, I did, I, I kicked around, a, a, I gave her a story, you know, a couple months ago, um, um, you know, one of my, my YouTube things. And then we did one last week, which was, uh, it's coming to me now. And it turns out that he had the, the cult and the cult isn't as bad as he thought it was. I'm like, I don't want to, I feel like I keep going to that well. You know what I mean? So perhaps sort of to, you know, keep things uh, in a, a variety here. Have this be something that is, as it is being applied here, explicitly not safe in some fashion, um, but with a but 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 and then maybe some of the reason for that is because it's being sort of done in the shadows, sort of thing, uh, which I guess has kind of hit uh, back to the sort of drug analogy sort of stuff a bit, uh, like you know needle exchanges and such like that. But it doesn't necessarily have to be quite so all yeah. the nose as far as what we're, um, we're talking about. You know, hu human needs are hmm. food, shelter. Uh, there's a reason they can't just ask for it, or they did ask for it, or Starfleet isn't going to do it, or Starfleet's not going to prioritize it highly enough. Like, DS9 didn't have a school <laughs> for a long time. It's like, how do you assign Starfleet officers to a post and not make a school? Yeah, that's a good question. Maybe there's something sort of fundamental as Maybe in, they're going to the planet. You know, like, so, something... something so, Something missing, you know, intellectually or uh, sociologically oh uh, or emotionally. Like, you know, maybe the, you know, maybe you have a situation where it's like a holodeck sort of thing where people are, you know, you know basically trying to emulate having friendships or something like that uh, on the holodeck with people that they would like to get to know, but because of various reasons are unable to get to know. And this is just kind of seen as really weird and kind of like a violation of those people's sort of, you know, uh, rights and things like that. That's, you know, that's maybe one option, but that kind of could drift very easily into another sort of territory of uh, I, uh, uh, discuss, uh, topics there. I wanted to pitch so an not, idea. Not really married to it. You said sociologically of someone on our ship actually getting involved in Federation politics, like running to be a, a senator or a council member or something like that. Uh, because again, we almost never see that fast in the Federation, and for reasons in this utopia, you don't. If people are good, the form of government doesn't matter so much, right? So sort sort of glossed over because yeah, you know, this well, it just works sort of thing. There's a black any box system run by bad making everything happen. Corrupt, and almost any system run by good people will be good. It doesn't matter if that is, uh, you know, a republic, or if that's you know this libertarian set of laws in the books. Or if it's even authoritarianism, if the people who run it and execute it are good, the benefits will be for everyone. And whether you call it voting or whether you call it being very attentive to public, to you know, scientifically analyze public feedback, you know, like a, a good system will emerge. So that the form has never been that important. But what it's done is it's created a, a civic agnosticism in Star Trek, where there is just no political dimension to their lives. Whenever there is very much a political dimension to our lives that should be very real and mm -hmm. we should we should engage in politics as good diligent citizens as rigorously as we would engage in um, work or socializing or, or physical fitness or our own health so what if what if we go in on that and say look there's no political dimension to this starbase and everyone said okay we're gonna live on the starbase it's fine we agree to that so we're not gonna like try to upend the social order of the starbase we just want to have like an organization and run this organization and i'm like what is this organization what is it doing it like they're moving stuff and they're allocating resources and there's how like what what's going on here cork is in the middle of all this exchange of goods but there's some sort of rule set here that we don't know and it turns out that like just in order to do like local civics they've created 
like a shadow, mm -hmm. uh, like a shadow cabinet with yeah. no authority or jurisdiction where people just do politics because it's, it's intrinsic to people to make them healthier. I, I rather like this actually. Uh, yes, it sort of has this sort of spooky sort of vibe to it at first. It's like there's been a number of people sort of going off and having secret meetings and things like that. And, you know, the, the administrators of the uh, Starbase are a little confused. And this has prompted apparently a, a, you know, groups of people getting up to certain things all at once. And we're a little concerned yeah. that it might have like a security implication. Because, you know, if, they're, you know if, if a bunch of people just sort of randomly organized and they're doing something together and you don't know why, and it's maybe something that, uh, you know, in a certain contexts is benign, but in other contexts could be, you know, very hostile, then it yeah. might, you know, be uh, really? making people nervous. But the people really yeah. just don't have any obligation to tell the <laughs> Starfleet folks what's um, up because like, it's not their damn you know, business. What, what government is um, and what it does. And you can even say, hey, look, because of this, this shadow government, um, they've actually solved problems on the station. And you can say, hey, look, this is how Starfleet kind of operates like de facto on a bigger scale. And, and they're, they're still involved in like regional sector and, and federation politics to the extent that any citizen would be within the larger polity, but the local polity politics are what they, they've recreated. And it is a slice, like a, a mm -hmm. core sample of federation society that we haven't seen before. Uh, we've kind of always wanted to see and in the best light. And I think that'd be like a cool little story. Like we don't, we don't have, I think we got to hash out um, our acts and our character moments, but <laughs> uh, I think that's a good structure. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, we, we could, you know, so I, I guess as far as the acts and character moments, uh, the first act is, you know, you know right before the, uh, the, cre the credits, uh, definitely, you know, we're coming into Starbase, Captain's Log, you know, everyone's Voiceover looking forward to some uh, shore leave, you know, and, uh, and people start meeting families, uh, and, you know, it's, uh, you know, you know, Kirk's just kind of smiling and being happy that everyone's uh, hanging out. Seven shows up. It's like, hey, do you mind if I talk to you? Because we might have a problem. There might be a threat to the station sort of thing. And then, you know, cue the credit sequence, uh, you know, commercial break. Uh, you know, you know, the sort of the main bit, uh, meat of the first act is uh, Seven sort of laying out, you know, some of the random details and things that people have been sort of picking up on. Um, and, you know, like some Admiral so-and-so is like, you know, this could potentially be a, you know, a plot that if these things are done, that it could lead to this other thing. And, you know, a whole pile of Star Trek, uh, very, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, this could have consequences sort of stuff if everything falls according to plan. This might be clearly an indication yeah, of an evil plot sort of stuff. Stakes. And but well, that's not uh, actually the case. Yeah. And so, you know, and so it's like Kirk's like, yeah, I want to go and check this out here. And so he starts, you know, sniffing around with some help from, uh, from the, uh, you know, other a couple of uh, other crew members, perhaps the ones who don't have um, much of the way of family here. Maybe. I mean, we um, haven't we haven't done a lot of uh, we haven't done a lot of like looking at the crew. We kind of did it in the first episode, and we kind of expected something maybe a little mm -hmm. more in the, the the second episode of the original series, give or take. Second episode of TNG, we had everybody get drunk and break down and kind of show their innermost person in, in fairly solid ensemble mm -hmm. episodes. Um, and, you know, DS9, both of its pilots, do a pretty good job of going through the characters and telling what their deal is and kind of learn more as we go along. Um, and we haven't really done that yet. And we, we physically can't. There's too many characters. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're kind of having to do that as we go through the various crew members. Uh, so this would be a good opportunity to sort of yeah. have a bunch of mini scenes uh, for a lot of the characters here to sort of give us at least a, a brief sort of, uh, you know, a hint of some of that, even if we're not able to do it in, you know, in depth. And that could be sort of our B plots as the, um, the, the sort of uh, investigating the civics organization is sort of the A plot. Um, and so we'd kind of be cutting back and forth from, from the from the two plot from the from the main plot to the sort of uh, scenes, and uh, you know it could be like one time uh, it's say Rand hanging out with her brother or something like that, and then you know the brother mentions like yeah I've been uh, talking to this other person who is the uh, you know this you know the spouse of uh, this person or the you know the sibling of this other person uh, or their kid or 
dad or something like that. And that sort of leads us, you know, you know, in sort of a series of interconnected sort of things, which then sort of builds into the uh, uh, this this idea of a, a community is, is formed here on the station that is linking both the, you know, the local folks, but also the crew members together in, in some, some interesting ways. And, you know, to sort of help, um, I guess, express more of the totality of uh, this sort of idea that this is a this is not just a place where star Starfleet stuff happens. Yeah. There are people here that live there that have their own sort of lives going on, and that is sort of you know you know in addition right. to all the Star Trek st- you know Starfleet stuff here. Uh, you got and, and so you can get sort of a you know help build up that sense that this these are people with real th- th- you know uh, reality behind them that they have real you know their their own characters as well and they got their own lives to lead and that this is something that is true not just of this star base but all star bases and planets yeah. and things like that uh you know in the universe right. it's, so it's good world don't building. forget that as we go uh, forward now you mentioned other 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 folks and who may not exactly. necessarily be federation folks that was another one of my pitches where Initially, Starfleet's focused on the non-Federation guys and a fairly stock xenophobia thing that we often see directed towards Quark in Deep Space Nine. You know, Cisco's attitudes towards mm-hmm. Ferengi are a great low-key story arc of Deep Space Nine. So, you know, one of the things that those guys still have commerce, right, and management. So, our, our shadow government there could yes. intersect those stores. It could be a thing for them to manage. And it could intersect there, and we can mm-hmm. weave those. And we should probably talk talk brass tacks on that um, before we're done here. So, you also mentioned, hey, real stakes. We need real stakes. And what we can say is, well, what if the shadow government already solved a problem, or what if it solves a problem that comes up while the episode's going on, right? Like there's an emergency, and somebody is like, hey, I actually have a really weird answer to that. And they're like, why do you have an answer to that? And he's like, because I do. <laughs> yes. Because <laughs> we worked this out. This would make sense. Like, uh, you know, I guess sort of one of the things is, you know, on starships, you know, right. like half the time the war corps is going to explode, right? Uh, so is this a problem on star bases I mean, as well? They use fusion reactors for a lot of stuff. My understanding is that war cores are just used because it has a high energy output ability. That that's what they need for the warp drives. Yes, and you need a certain uh, power level here that isn't necessarily right. required right. for a whole uh, star. Base. Unless the star base could go to warp, which, considering how much I gripped about the planet shields in Star Trek Picard, might make me a hypocrite if I were to pitch that a warp capable star base. <laughs> uh, but you would need you, music, need least. <laughs> you would need a credible threat, which, because it's a star base, yes. would have to be big, and it cannot be solved by the Enterprise or maybe the Enterprise being. Is doing the degaussing, right? They're doing the baryon soup or whatever. It's off. It's it's off. It's cold, cold shut down, and it would take more than Spock with a head full of equations to get it going in time. How about something like this? You know, something you know glitches with the uh, you know the, the the sweep or docking arms, whatever, and so the the Enterprise almost or completely empty uh, gets unmoored and starts drifting off in a, you know, where it shouldn't be, and this is either going to impact the station in some uh, fashion, uh, you know, p- potentially causing to explode and killing everybody on the station as well, uh, or alternatively just damaging something that could be, you know, to lead to a lot of damage and or death for people. Uh, like, you know, sh- shorting off, you know, shorting out an important force field containment system that would, you know, evacuate all the air out of the, like, a whole bunch of decks or something like that. Sort of a, this is a unlikely sort of problem, but enough things kind of going wrong at the same time sort of will lead to this. And it's sort of, you know, one of those situations where it's like, well, we could have solutions for any one of these happening at the same, uh, at once, but, you know, the, uh, you know, know, and because those are the things we think about, we're Starfleet, but kind of having them all in this weird sort of uh, combined sort of situation, that's a little unexpected, uh, especially since, you know, half the things that we would try to solve any one of these issues have has been disabled because of something else that's already uh, taken yeah. place in this sort of you mini disaster. things to be really busy, and then you would need an X factor, like an alien ship that has, like, a weird feel, or like, oh, mm-hmm. we're meeting the, the Quablarians, and they don't even use warp drives, they use some other things. They're going to be here for a diplomatic reception. Like, oh, it's going to be 
you know, like, I'm not going to meet them, but I'm going to be here for the reception. Because, like, that happens. You're like, oh, what? We're, we're doing a cool thing? Well, I have sufficient rank. I'd like to be there for that and stand around for it. I'd like to be at that reception. And so you're like, okay, all right, so they're, just, they're doing whatever for the Enterprise. Um, and then the Quabalarians are coming in. And so their ship's there. It's like, oh, crap, their ship makes bongo rays or whatever. And they're like, oh, well, that, that, that screws up one little bit of these clamps that we use for whatever. And then, and then we get kind of a, a, a mousetrap board game of things going wrong. Yeah. One thing leads to another and suddenly, you know, uh, you know everything's on the, on the fritz. So you don't know what's causing the actual problem. Right. So I like that for being um, like kind of, kind of our first high stakes incident where we're investigating this, this weird little collection of, of civilians and occasionally they'll call each other titles. They have like little titles, and I'll occasionally hear them call each other names, like Kirk or something. And then, so Kirk, so that suddenly, like, the entire star race is on red alert. You know, the Quadlarian ship has been here for a minute, so, like, whatever, no one cares. And then, boom, the Enterprise is on board, like, oh no, tractor beams, oh no. And then, civilians, like, with the B plot of, hey, civilians, they don't know anything. They, they, they saw it, right? And they're like, hey, um, we kind of thought this might happen. And Kirk's like, the odds of that. Of that is that emergency happening and you guys seeing it happen are pretty nil and the guys well you know we're just good at our jobs and kirk's like undoubtedly as, apparently that's kind of like a, a um they think you say that you don't mean um not not pablum gross he's like right yeah, yeah i'm sure you guys are great at your jobs like like when politicians say the american workforce is the greatest workforce it's the thing they say it's polite and so that's like in our first act to keep the attention up or maybe, maybe begins the second act, right? Like Kirk's making progress, we're learning about the problem, and then this happens, and we're like, this is, this is weird. So then it turns out that um, we're like, hey, you know, someone mentioned, like Jake Sisko mentioned, he was studying Quobalarian poetry or whatever, um, or like the poetry of Quobalarian docking mechanisms. And Sisko's like, Quobalarians, docking mechanisms. Wait a minute. Maybe this is related to that. Or it might not. It might not be. You know, uh, Ben Cisco. If if you're doing a family episode, like it has to be Ben and Jake have to be in it. They don't have to be significant. They just have to yes. be like a picture because that is like ninety percent of Ben Cisco's character. It could be uh, Sulu yeah. and his partner. It could be anything. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay. So then that kind of gets them. That gives them a lead. Where they're like, okay, these things were. And it's like, turns out that the civilians knew about Quobalarians and theorized this and that. But they're like, yeah, it's just kind of a thing for the government. Like they release, they had a committee. They made, they released a study. <laughs> um, <laughs> or heck, it doesn't even necessarily have to be these these threats of aliens specifically. But uh, you know, you know, just the mentioning of you know, you know, docking clamp failure, or whatever, yeah, you know, could be enough to sort of uh, kick things off. And uh, I, I'm imagining now that the absurd solution that happens is seemingly at random certain uh you know you know sections of the the starbase suddenly start venting atmosphere and that just tilts the starbase just slightly enough so that the you know the enterprise isn't running anything uh and everyone's like oh what the hell just happened it's okay. like there, mm-hmm. there's some sort of weird coordinated uh you know evacuation of these areas that was you know you know because the thrust the station thrusters were offline or whatever you know that was able to sort of push us just just the perfect amount here yeah. and it's that's really weird um so you know my take was is that you know out of civic duty like hey the quibblerians are coming they don't use warp L- let's do a really nerdy in-depth worst case scenario study mm-hmm. of that you know so we have yeah. we had a month to do this we're all you know we're all experts on the, the docking clamp systems the station thrusters this that and the other thing and so they, they make their own internal studies so they're like you know what we're also going to make answers. It's like, oh, well, we have a handbook for this now. This really unlikely thing happened. Now we have a handbook. And so, mm-hmm. you know, maybe the thrusters are offline because they're doing maintenance. And it's like, well, okay. And then, like, the, the valves for the emergency reactivation of the thrusters freeze or whatever. And that, that's why they've got, like, this emergency contingency. And then, you know, I feel like we need another, like, capping emergency where Kirk is like, hey, we know something's going on. We know it's actually, like, way big. But now we have another bigger emergency that's happening. 
Well, uh, perhaps uh, either the first emergency or the second emergency, there's suspicion that these you know, groups of civilians might have been the cause of it as well. And so that's kind of helps build the stakes as far as like, we need to make sure that, you know, this is, it's not our own people that are sabotaging things sort of stuff. Um, yeah, but there is that suspicion because they know too much about it, right? And they're working with supplies mm-hmm. that are related to that. And that are related to the, the Xenos. So, like the first arc, we think it's the Xenos, and then the second arc um, is Xena. Is Xenos bigoted? Is it bigoted to say Xenos? I know it's from Forty K, but like, um, <laughs> well, they're aliens. Um, is that bigoted? The, the people from cultures who are not the Federation. <laughs> um, we suspect them are like yeah, the first well, arc outsiders. Uh, and Quark is in there, and Quark is his role is that he, he knows he knows everything, right? Because he's Quark. Um, mm-hmm. Or maybe he suspects, but he doesn't really give a crap, right? As long as yeah, it's like yeah, there's something happening. going on here, but it's not really anything that's going to affect me. So yeah. just kind of keep an eye on it, make sure that that, that, that status quo remains. So it'd be interesting, right? So they jump in and they fix things, and Quark is like, "All right, actually, I could have just died there." <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> so maybe this is all right, <laughs> Captain Kirk. I would like to help you solve this thing. Um, mm-hmm. and Kirk's like, okay, well, you know, my whole crew, their families are here. I don't know if I can trust them. Odo, you also don't have a family here because he's Odo. Um, mm-hmm. and Odo's a security guy. <laughs> we, oh, well, Odo, we know who your family is and they suck. So <laughs> yeah, so it's like, they're also not here. So the three of us can work together and get to the bottom of this. The second arc is they're, they're kind of hunting down. They're getting clues about mm-hmm. like the shadow government on board the station they're, they're moving supplies we're like oh, well all federation citizens they don't not rations because they're so generous like you could almost never use all of them it would be weird if you use yes. them so it's essentially unlimited uh, but people are using a lot of them you know they're using it for different things and they don't really have to justify it to anyone this is the federation they just know what they do you want you want to make okay, you know you know maybe there's something like really absurd like you know there, there seems to be a weird movement of a bunch of cargo from this part of the station to this other part of the station. And yeah. we're not sure why. And like at the end of the explanation is like, yeah, because you know, if this weird thing happens with the, you know, rotation of the station or something like that, it's going to be, you know, tilt everything off balance and that's going to, you know, do some massive structural damage. That's, you know, not going to be observed for a few years, but it's going to basically, you know, destroy the station. So, you know, we wanted to avoid that. <laughs> it's not all like in the weeds contingencies. Like that's one thing they do. The other thing is like trade, right? And ensuring mm-hmm. supplies uh, and things, and and just saying, and facilitating trade, maybe even negotiating collectively on behalf of the folks on the station. Whereas Ferengi are like, well, we can't have a union, but we want Tulaberry wine. And the the folks on the station are like, well, we're going to negotiate on your behalf collectively because we can get the Tulaberry wine, so you get better working conditions, and your employer gets access to a resource that we can arrange or that we can make. I don't think that works. So, like, there are governments. They do multiple different things that are for the benefit of everyone. So, mm-hmm. when you look at all the pieces individually, you're like, I, I don't understand all of this because this doesn't connect to each other. The only benefit is the end result of the common good. Um, and we don't get that until our day mom, which, which closes out Act 3 and our, our biggest piece of action. And these guys are like, hey, all right, fine. We can do this. You just have to trust us. And Kirk's like, why would we trust him? He's like, okay. <laughs> so in a nutshell, <laughs> <laughs> we have a government and we have like, you know, emergency supplies for this, or we have a back channel to these guys, or they're here because of us. Um, and, you know, we were supposed to contact them this way, but they didn't do it. Um, not, not in a way that like the shadow government screwed up, but in a way that, um, you know, they have a, a solution to a problem that yeah. would, 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 happen, would have happened anyway. Right. I don't want to be like another, we had a contingency for it. I don't want it to be, we screwed up and therefore danger. So it needs to be danger that they can solve simply because they have resources on hand to solve it. Well, uh, yeah, maybe there is, you know, we've got, we got, got the weird aliens who showed up. Uh, maybe they discover that there's a, uh, another ship that's visiting from someone that they really don't like. And there's going to be, you know, you know, rising tensions and, it could be a firefight or something like that, but you know the civilian government you know, is able to sort of diffuse the situation by basically providing the things that you know 
you know, you know, kicked off the whole disagreement in the first place. Like you are angry because this person, you know, ran off with you know, your 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 stem bolt factory or whatever. Right. Well, we happen to have everything needed to build one of those right here because we, you know, we're worried that we might have to build a, a stem bolt factory or something like that. Uh, so <laughs> we'll let you have this, and there you go. That, that's, I like that. And it would be even funnier if towards the end of the second act, third act. Kirk is running around getting wise to these things, and Kirk can be a little intuitive, and he's like, hey, you, right in a civilian, what are those, and where are you going with them? And he's like, oh, they're just stuff, I'm just moving them, and he stops, he's like, you know what, actually, hold up on that. And so Kirk, in investigating this, is like, hey, my hunch is, we're, this is part of whatever we're doing, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to flunk you, I'm going to stun you. A lot of Kirk's route to investigating is fucking around and finding out. Yep. That's like part of his process. <laughs> he, he wanders around and then stuff happens and he notices like, oh, this might mean this. Okay, let's go. <laughs> he, he messes with things and then he checks the results. Yeah. It's not methodical, but it's consistent and it yields results. And mm -hmm. so if he does that here, he can actually interrupt the, the plot-related symbol shipments that they're trying to move around um, the station. And mm -hmm. him or Odo, right, classic odo -dum, you know, shape shifting into whatever they're they're smuggling, and uh, and Quark can be like, "Hey, I know all about the storage and the movers and all that kind of stuff." So they can actually play defense and be trying to flush someone out. And what they're actually doing is they're torpedoing these factional diplomatic efforts between these two people. Like, this isn't enough. Yeah, we're one short. I'm pretty sure we brought one in. Oh, hi, Odo. Odo. Uh, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> so. Um, so then in the end, whoever we have for running that civilian government, and that could be seven of nine. Um, I know you wanted to have her like on the other side of that. Well, it, it could be a thing where seven is being, you know, asked to tip off Kirk that there's a thing going on, but she kind of, you know, is skeptical of sort of, you know, you know, her, her own role in it. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, is, uh, you know, is, is kind of, originally trying to just sort of uh, lead uh, Kirk uh, away in some fashion, potentially. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, you know, it could be, uh, I, you know, you know, another good <laughs> op uh, option for, for who to be in charge, uh, Keiko. Um, I would love for Keiko to run the shadow government of Starbase 47. Um, yes. That would be the greatest <laughs> thing. But, you know, you mentioned that and I didn't like it. And then I thought, well, what, what if we make it a four-man band? Right, Kirk, mm -hmm. Odo, Quark, and um, a low stakes traitor. Where maybe it is seven of nine, or maybe it is Keiko. I don't want to make Keiko a traitor, but um, I would like her to run things and eventually, like, all signs point to Keiko or whatever. Uh, in fandom, not could be Neelix. <laughs> you hurt me, but it'd be a good, I mean, oh, like, like Neelix is part of the team. Mm -hmm. Oh, that would be wild. I feel like Neelix and Quark have some overlap. They're very different characters. Don't get me wrong. But I feel like there's a little bit of, of overlap. Um, mm -hmm. A little bit. <laughs> so uh, the, the one of them is more, more explicitly a scoundrel than the other, but yes. Yeah, I wouldn't want someone that we that we that that the fandom doesn't already like to be the traitor. You know what I mean? Like, people don't like Keiko. It's like, oh, she's the traitor. Even if it's in, like, this fun, harmless context, I don't, I don't like it. Same thing, with, same thing with Neelix. Fandom doesn't like Neelix. I have called him star trek snarf but like a bit yeah I, I, I don't want to feed into that i don't i don't want to have i don't bring that negativity here um so i'd much rather it be someone like seven who we kind of like uh i'm trying to think of, of other characters we can have as we're uh there's there's libby is she the kid she's uh harry kim's uh, uh fiance let's, let's start a voyage yeah, isn't she like mentioned in two episodes um, um she's mentioned a few times uh she actually shows up uh uh, in, that one time, you know, uh, Harry ends up in an alternative yeah. timeline. Uh, there's always a uh, Ezri Dax's uh, family. They're kind of shady, what you know. About uh, no, no, no. Gaina, Gaina feels yeah. the same old as Quark, where she's she's kind of like a token civilian guy. I don't know. I think Seven of Nine seems as like a special attaché who's just like involved in whatever. You know, whenever Especially. early on in TNG, they had where no man has gone before, where we first went to Traveler, and the Traveler is traveling with a guy named Kozinski, who wore Starfleet uniform, but had no Starfleet rank. He was just Mr. Kozinski. Yes. Because he was like, like I'm just kind of being special, dude. Yeah. Um, 
And he was like a civilian consultant to the Federation. That, that was my take on it. So it would be interesting if Seven was like a civilian consultant. Not, not wearing a Starfleet uniform, because I don't know why they did that. I mean, they had the uniforms, I guess. But where Seven's just like, hey, look, I'm just like a civilian consultant at large that's working for stuff. And the Admiral was like, hey, whatever. How are you doing, Jim? And, you know, does Admiral, you know, everybody in Starfleet knows everybody. And then he's like, here's Seven of Nine. She's she's really talented with analysis. So I've, I've, I want her, I want you to liaise with her to get to the bottom of this thing. And it turns out that she's actually part of it in the end. And so she's there trying to go. stop there Kirk from stopping the thing. Uh, do you want to name Admiral or just Admiral of the Week? I mean, I, you know, Admiral of the Week or Commodore of the Week. I mean, you can pull one from the bin. I don't think it much matters. I guess he's, he's going to be a recurring character. So if you want a recurring admiral that we're familiar with that pulls from Star Trek lore, that would probably be Bob Ross. Is that right? Hmm. Wait, is that guy's name literally Bob Ross? That can't be right. <laughs> There's uh, Admiral Ross. Admiral Ross, yeah. He had a first name, though. It could be Bob. Admiral, my memory is Ross. But admiral Ross from Deep Space Nine. Because he um, kind of had that. Will, problem. I think. Will? Okay. So Bill, Bill, not Bob. So, <laughs> right. So, so you'd be kind of there facilitating and then the, the conflict. They're like, hey, you know, whatever. And so not and then and so Kirk discovers that Seven's trying to stymie his efforts to stymie that, and then the thing breaks out. There's there's a kerfluffle on board. Um and, and maybe they're shooting at each other, maybe they're going to shoot each other, maybe there's like an explosive heirloom that they're supposed to like trade to make peace, whatever the stakes are, right? And then Seven's like, Okay, we actually have a solution to this, you just have to trust me. Um, yeah, so we'll, we'll we'll get this sorted out. Don't worry about it. But but I am worried about. It. Um, okay, but that's fine. Okay, but do you trust me to help figure this out? Yeah, maybe. <laughs> and so then, uh, yeah, I'm really liking how this is how this is rolling yeah. so far. Uh, as, and so you know, do we want there to be any sort of actual firefight, or do we want to uh, just sort of a uh, the threat of it? I mean, just, you know, whatever, whatever works better for the story, I guess. So, um, if, if people die, um, you know what? People die in real life. Two, they're, they're going to die because Kirk, Kirk was messing around with things if for a, what is ultimately a very low stakes adventure, right? Mm -hmm. um, there's secretly a government because people desire to be politically active. <laughs> yep. Um, <laughs> you know, it's more than one authority now. Right. And, and I, don't, I don't know if people need to die in a story like that. Yeah, well, you know, I was just saying, you know, I don't necessarily need to have anyone die, but like warning shots sort of things. Yeah, it'd uh, probably make it exciting. Like, like if, if something explodes. <laughs> Who's firing phasers in space dark? What the hell? <laughs> so there's an episode of Babylon 5 where I want to say the Drazi are having a symbolic thing where they reach into a bag and pull out oh, purple yeah. that's, and that's, green stars. And like, they're just kind of green, rolling around. There. And one, it's a great episode. It's, yes. it's fantastic. I think of Bonnie gets her leg broken because she's trying to figure out the nature of it. And she takes the, the the scars off of two guys and wears both of them and they lose their crap over it. But um It's like, it's like wait, this is impossible. No. Yeah. Uh, oh, I love that. Yeah, Babylon five, not sophisticated, but really good. Like it just it was wasn't a pretentious <laughs> series. It's like, look, this is what we're doing. They're Babylon five. Um We're gonna have a thing now. So right. Yeah. So I think I think you want the stakes to ultimately be high, like they're fighting around a giant explosive globe or whatever, or maybe like an ancient urn that's full of old back now something. Uh, but like ultimately, the violence you see is just like fisticuffs and, and yelling and stuff. Yeah, well, uh, would be fun. Well, well, it could be a situation where the you know, the, the, you know, the, the the little the limited violence that there is breaks out in a, a place with a lot of civilians and so they're very much like this ain't cool we're gonna do something about this right now um seven are you, are you, can you help us out with this thing um and then you know kirk sort of starts picking up like wait she's working with his random people over here that are okay it seems they're freaking out about what's going on which is good but they seem to be trying to do something on top of that hmm uh, if, we have to, if we have to go in to save the civilians at the station, I think it undermines the message of, of like self-sufficiency and self-efficacy that we're we're building for the civilians on the station. If we're like, okay, they'll die yeah. in the explosion, obviously that's different. But if we're like, oh, they'll be in a melee, these wilting lilies of Federation citizens can't really deal with that. It would be a more hilarious if they were worried the Federation citizens were going to, with their free healthcare and like, you know, calisthenics talk from junior high and casual knowledge of martial arts each 
they're like, oh no, those Federation citizens will hurt the diplomats. <laughs> um, that's maybe like slightly too too up there. Well, maybe that you know off screen we have a thing where yeah, you know, there's a fight, and then a bunch of the you know, the local uh, citizens like broke it up before the security showed up, and we're a little a little weirded out that they were able, that they did that just kind of without waiting for anyone. <laughs> yeah, and that would that'd be a good way to do. It. Um, what would be interesting uh, is, and, 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 and that's like motivation for the the two alien uh, races to try to bring their disagreement to somewhere, uh, you know, else. And that's what what they're they're worried about now that they're going to start, you know, fighting in the fusion chamber or whatever because that's where nobody else is, and so they're not going to be uh, prevented from uh, finishing their fight. But if they end up fighting there, it's going to cause all sorts of problems. What if? Okay, all right. Tellerites. We never use tellerites, right? Uh, disagreeable, mm -hmm. uh, socially, rah, 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 and the Bulgarians. Yeah, they like to argue. Um, are are like not into that. I don't want to say they're sensitive. I'm just saying they don't want to deal with the a hole pig race, which fair. So, like like their their social things are incredibly incompatible. So what they're running interference on and shipping things around for are keeping those guys in their own little circles, right? Because if they fight, you know, they'll punch each other, they'll draw some blood, throw some spit around, get skin on each other, but, like, their body chemistry is mad incompatible, okay? So if these guys start mixing up bodily fluid or skin and spit or whatever, it actually makes, like, a caustic gas. Oh. So like, <laughs> and so them just literally fighting will kill everyone nearby. It'll be bad. It'll be treatable, but it'll be bad. Yeah. <laughs> And so, like, okay, so, like, two of them get into a fight, and we can see that happen. And your thing, where, like, the civilians step in to separate, it's like, oh, this almost like they were um, prepared for this to happen, and they were, you know, as it just so happens, two civilians who have, like, training in this uh, knew to do that, which is mysterious. Mm -hmm. But it also shows, like, that's the deal. These two people cannot be allowed to physically fight, and they're sociologically incompatible. So, like, that's established, you know, in another little tension moment where we get, like, where we get some fisticuffs. Um, and they're like, oh, the two, the two contingents, whatever, like, they, they didn't get their, their ale or whatever that they wanted. But they know it's on the other side of the station in the, the promenade or the Zocalo or whatever you want to call it. And so if they go over there and it's like, oh, they're already there. And so I was like, I've got a plan and I've got the booze. Just, like, work with me to get this done. And Kirk's like, but you're obviously working for whatever the conspiracy is. And she's like, but it's not, it's not about that. It's just a bunch of civilians. We're just trying to, we're just trying to make sure things go smoothly because like, we just, we just want to have control over our environment. Like, is that so hard to fucking deal with? Um, which I think also echoes seven of nine pretty well, uh, especially in her interactions with Janeway. No offense, but Janeway's inconsistent, inconsistency and humanizing seven of nine is something I've noticed in Voyager. And I'm, I don't know. I feel like it's reflected in the seven of nine that we see in Star Trek Picard. We're running kind of, I think we have like five minutes left. Oh, so, like that. Okay. So is there a scene or is there a character interaction or something else that we want to make sure we get in there? Something that uh, goes in the trailer. Well, we already have the Quark Kirk face off, right? Uh, right slash team up. And so at some point, you know, near the end, we're going to need. Uh, perhaps you know the 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 Kirk uh, Seven sort of face off, where she's sort of you know you know both confirming what's been going on, uh, but also sort of like you know it's like she, you know, there's, there's sort of a you know a stigma against this sort of thing perhaps uh, being you know sort of done you know independent on a station where there is a you know an official authority. Uh, but you know they, they they're like well we're not Starfleet we just happen to live here sort of stuff and it is kind of nice to be able you know to to go out there and be civically engaged and to take care of our home uh, even if you know there's you know a lot of sort of you know other stuff that we don't have to worry about there's still things that we worry about that isn't being considered by what you know about what the Starfleet's all about and so that's kind of our ultimate thing I did want to have a character from the crew kind of get into politics. And that it would be it would be interesting to see Odo run for office. Yep. Um, <laughs> well, uh, maybe you know it's it's Kirk uh, Seven and our uh, our tempted uh, character here. 
Um, you know, so you know, the, Odo is 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 an option. Uh, you know, you know, exp, you know, exp, though there 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 probably be some uh, you know hurdles. It's like, but what about the Dominion and the, the other changelings? And you're trying to come in and take over our government, you know, which could be a pl- plot for later. Then, I mean, uh, that would be interesting if Odo gets involved in local politics. And the, another thread that comes up later is, but he had changeling, so and it's great. You can't changelings can't infiltrate your government if your government's already changelings. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, you know, that could be an interesting, uh, you know, character study for, uh, you know, Odo as he sort of, you know, it's like, you know, do, yeah, you know, am I doing this because I'm tempted to follow in the, uh, you know, the, the footsteps of my people, or is this something that is sort of, uh, you know, a, a calling that I'm being sort of brought into? Uh, you know, given what I've I've learned and experienced, and so that, that's sort of a all things sort of explore and uh, sort of an episode more focused on that specifically. Um, but yeah, 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 I think it'd be good to you know kick off to uh, uh, you know at the very least uh, you know if not him, uh, at least give him the option to be in that role. Yeah, yeah, be good. So okay, well that's good. I um. I don't, I don't know a name for it. We'll, we'll talk a name later. But uh, until then, I think that's a good episode. I think that's it's it's done. Cool. That's signed, finished. All right. The um, end. I don't know. <laughs> but let's go uh, uh, submit this to the executive producers and see what happens. <laughs>